Thank you for the nice introduction. And good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about how information is processed or decoded in development of living organisms. And the question that I'm going to address is, how is it possible that a single cell uh, develops to a complex multicellular organism in a very reproducible way. And by reproducibility, I mean the proportion of body parts and the structure of this organism is maintained with high accuracy. But to start with, I have a question for you. Do you know what is on this image? There, there were some spoilers in the abstract, if anyone read that one. So this is a fruit fly egg. It's a single cell. Each dot here is a single cell nucleus. And what, what is amazing or astonishing to me is that this, uh, oh, sorry. It started with a, as a single cell with a single nuclei a single nucleus, and after 13 rounds of nuclear uh, divisions, it got to 6,000 nuclei in less than two hours. And all these nuclei are identical, but shortly after this nuclear cell cycle 13, they will be, yeah, this is, okay, anyway, this, uh, they will be, separated through cell walls, and they will become uh, cells, separated cells that will acquire specific cell fates. Later on, these this cells will form groups, and these groups of cells will give rise to different body parts. Okay, this raises a question, how cells on one side on the embryo, they, they know that they are going to be a future head, or on the other side, that they are going to be future tail of the uh, fruit fly. And the answer to this question is that this positional information is provided by the bicoid protein, that this bicoid protein was deposited, deposited on one end of the embryo by the mother, long before it was fertilized. And then after fertilization and during those cell, cycle, cell cycles of nuclear divisions, this bicoid spreads across the tissue, forming gradient of concentration. And here we see that on, so this is roughly this, this two hours, it creates a stable gradient with uh, maximum on one side, maximum concentration and minimum on the other side where the future tail is going to be. And what one can do next is to quantify the signal by taking the uh, slice through this embryo. So it's not actual slice, but it's like with confocal microscopy, one just can select one plane and then measure the fluorescent intensity along the anterior-posterior axis, so head to tail axis. And this fluorescent intensity is shown here. And now cells that read this gradient, they have access to positional information. So we can, we can say that through, mm, so, so because it's a member of a larger class of proteins, so-called morphogens, and the morphogens are just signaling molecules that by creating a concentration gradient, activate the target genes in concentration dependent manner. So if here you see a classical model uh, of French flag from L Louis Wolpert that was proposed in late 70s, long before any of those morphogens were actually measured, but the model is simple. It just says that if there is high concentration of morphogen, it activates the blue gene. If there is medium concentration, it activates the white gene. And if there is low concentration, the red gene gets activated, expressed, and this creates a downstream pattern of gene expression. 
that resembles the French flag. In terms of information theory, this first layer, this is the input signal. The cells are processing the signal. What is processing the signal is, are the gene regulatory networks within those cells. And as an output, one gets the pattern of gene expression. Okay, in biology, nothing is ideal. So this input signal is, is noisy. There are fluctuations in the signal. And of course, the more noisy the signal is, the cells that are reading the concentration have access to less positional information. We can quantify that with the so-called positional error, which in, simple, in the simplest case, when we have just one morphogen signal, is just this positional error, so the sigma x is the spread or the standard deviation of the gene expression or the morphogen signal times the inverse of the slope. So what we have from this definition is that if the slope is steep, the positional error is typically very small. If, it, if the slope of the gradient gets uh, less steep, then of course the, the positional error increases. And if it's flat, it is basically undetermined. So to sum up, the uh, positional error is a measure of positional imprecision that quantifies the uncertainty with which the cells are reading their position. So now let's see, using this definition, what is the, the positional error observed in the fruit fly. But instead of taking this example, simple example with the bicoid, I will go one step downstream to the so-called four gap genes. So those four gap genes are activated by mm, the bicoid, or some of them are directly activated, like the hunchback and cripple. But what is for, for you is enough just, and for me here, just to say that this first layer, those four signals, this is the input layer. So the morphogen signal, and this signal give rise to stripe pattern of Eve expression. So those are the blue stripes here that are very <laughs> precisely specified. But we want to know how exactly. So one could estimate first this positional imprecision directly from the measurements, just taking different embryos, staining them, measuring the fluorescent intensity, overlaying, and voila, we have the, we, we could quantify what's the deviation of the position of the maximum of those stripes within the embryo length. So embryo length is L, X is position, so this, this is like a relative position in the embryo. And it turns out, it turns out that this Positional imprecision is on the order of one cell diameter. And this precision is maintained almost through, throughout the whole embryo here. So if we now, in, in this range, along the anterior posterior axis, there are about 16 nuclei. So each of these nuclei has enough, uh, is specified basically uniquely. And now there is a question, are the, or do the inform, positional information conveyed in the input signal, the four gap genes, is enough to specify the pattern with this precision? And it turns out the answer is yes, it is enough. So if you use the generalized definition of the positional error, the, for the joint positional error where C is the uh, covariance matrix between the signals, we see that if all signals are used, so this is this black curve, the, the positional error estimated with this formula is also at the order of one cell diameter across the, the whole embryo. If only some signals are used, then they are enough just to specify the pattern within smaller ranges. 
Okay. And now, mm, let me just summarize this introduct introductory part by saying, okay, wh what we learned. So morphogens provide a coordinate system for patterning of developing tissues. I brought back this panel here to, and with, with the exponential decay fitted to, to, to highlight that the, the position information or in, in this developing system is quantitative. Like one could estimate the biophysical parameters like the diffusion constants, like I don't know, degradation times, propose different models and test them. And also the, here, I, I didn't like mention it, but one can do experiments with different flies <coughs> and it turns out <coughs> that this, pa this, this profile of bicoid scales with the size. So if on the, by the factor of, or for, for if, if the egg is larger or smaller by a factor of five, the, the profile is maintained. Like in, so that, that is also an indication that there is a mechanism through which this profile is formed that helps to maintain the proportions of the body parts through scaling. Further, we saw that the positional information, information conveyed in the input signals corresponds to uh, the positional imprecision at the output, which might indicate that the cells are actually doing some kind of optimal decoding. Like there is uh, just a very, they, they basically use the whole information that is in the input signal. And last but not least, the positional error is about one cell diameter, uh, which might indicate that if from, from the evolutionary perspective, the, it's unlikely that the, the organisms evolved to have precision on the subcellular level. That, that's, I think, like one cell is what, what we can expect from some of the system at least. The question is whether these properties of decoding of positional information are just unique for the fruit fly, or are they more general? So that makes me to, to ask this question, what are the principles of information decoding in developmental systems? And now I will move on to another developmental system that I worked during my postdoc, and that was namely the spinal cord. Uh, you yes. The yes. Sure. In, in principle, I can, I can think about some genetic manipulation. So the, uh, the fly will get, for example, two pairs of wings or something like that. Yes. So how would you position this, this in this language? So, that's a very good question, and I will, mm, so there are two answers. One, this is like a descriptive approach, and what we need is a mechanistic approach where we have a model that could exactly answer that, and this is what I will do in this part by considering the gene regulatory network. That will allow me to ask exactly, if you knock down one of the genes, what happens? If you add one gene, what happens? But um, it's also possible to just do those, or, mm, and this is by a group of Gaspert Kacik and uh, Julian Dubois, uh, Thomas Gregor, like you, you could generate different mutants and then see how different signals give rise to, like, like create of, uh, how do, or it's a kind of decoding map or a decoding atlas. So given that signal, this is what we observe. And then having enough of that, one could do this inference not for, for the new mutants. And this also works for Drosophila, amazingly. Like, mm, okay. So now, now to continue, uh, as I said, I, I work with uh, the spinal cord. So we all know what is the spinal cord. It's a kind of tube that we have in our bodies. But when it develops, it starts from the neural plate that folds, and it's, uh, it basically 
has a tissue where the cells are naive, so they, they don't have any specific phase. And what is important, there are two morphogens. One, sonic hedgehog, produced at the mm, ventral side. Ventral means like belly, belly side. And then on the opposite side of this tube, there is BMP, bone morphogenic protein, that is produced on the dorsal side. And those morphogens spread across the tissue. They form a gradient of concentration. Depending on the concentration, different genes are activated, giving rise to different domains of gene expression that are he here depicted with, with blue and red. And depending on which genes are activated, different neural progenitors are produced, and these neural progenitors give rise to different types of neurons. So on the on the ventral side, these are like motor neurons and interneurons, something that is responsible for how you control movement. And on the dorsal side, these are sensory neurons, so something that uh, helps you to interpret like different sensory feelings like touch or, I don't know, pain from, from outside. So what, what is amazing for me is that this pattern here in a um, illustrated with schematic is actually there are 13 domains giving rise to different types of neurons and this is all established in a growing tissue and so this is the dorsal ventral cross section through the spinal cord and over 60 hours it increases from 100 micrometers to 400 micrometers and what we see here those are different on the, the cross sections were taken at different embryonic days. They were immunostain for uh, the gene expression profiles and for uh, like here in the red or for uh, the this morphogen signaling profiles. And starting from something that has no domains, they form a pattern where the domains are clearly visible. So now if we quantify this signal, we see that in the top row you see the, the morphogen signals, the BMP and sonic hedgehog signal, that they initially uh, cover the whole uh, tissue, uh, neural, or the whole spinal cord on, in this dorsal ventral axis, and, but over time, as the tissue grows, this is in relative units, they, they kind of move away from each other. If I would plot that in absolute units, the, the decay length of each of these profiles, they can be well fitted with the exponential decay, will, would stay constant. So simply because the, there is the growth, they move away from each other. Here you see the output of the system, two genes, two expression levels of the genes, PAX3 and KX6.1, but the names are not so important. Initially, they are, the output is correlated with the input, but then around 30 hours, the, the genes start to form the, the domains with sharply uh, marked boundaries. Okay, we can now just quantify the level of the positional imprecision in the signal using the definition of the joint position, uh, position error for the joint signals. And what we see is that only for early times, so the very light colors here, these are around plus minus three cell diameters, which goes up very quickly as the time goes. So it, it corresponds to this situation that the morphogens move away from each other. But on the, at the initial stage, this precision is low, or the, the precision is high, and uh, distributed uniformly across the spinal cord. If we now measure what is the imprecision of the boundary position after 60 hours, it turns out to be around three cells. So there's this another, it's another case where we have this coincidence of uh, the imprecision in the input signal and in the output. So what, what I thought, might be interesting is what happens if we now mm, 
just assume that the cells are doing the are following the optimal decoding strategy of the signal. And with that, one can create a kind of decoding map where what you see here, this is the concentration space with one morphogen on one axis, the other on the other. It's log log. So if we now have the concentrations that are uh, observed in the wild type embryo, this so they, they were the exponentially decaying profiles from the opposite sides, and then this makes a straight line here. So what is observed in biology during development at the initial stage, this is the black line. And for the high BMP, this gives rise to the, the very dorsal domain. For the very low uh, BMP and high sonic hedgehog, this gives, this gives rise to the ventral. Uh, I, I will give you, all right, this is, I might also give you a formula because this is not like, it's also quantitative. So what, what we exactly did here is to have the, to assume that the signal is uh, around the mean is just a bivariate Gaussian distribution where CS and CB are the concentrations like here, this BMP and cash flow activity. And what goes in to specify this map is the average profile of CB. That, that this is like the measurement CB of X and the uh, noise of this signal that is also from the measurement. And having that and assuming those are distributed without correlation here uh, with, with the bivariate Gaussian, now we just ask if the cells are exhibiting any concentration, not the one, not only the one that is on the wild type curve, what would be the fate that is most likely? So close to this wild type curve, this black curve, one gets very similar domains to what, what is in the biology, which makes, which makes sense because the, the embryo is very likely uh, robust to small fluctuations, but we had an interesting prediction for the region that is here in shaded gray, where both concentrations of the morphogens are high. And then it turns out that instead of unimodal distribution that is typical for the uh, wild type curve, we observe a bimodal distribution where uh, it's either very dorsal or very ventral, which of course means that if the cells are doing that, or they, they kind of in, interpret the signal, some cells will end up to be very dorsal, with very dorsal fate, and some will end up with very ventral fate. And this is what we ask ex people doing experiments to check. And what they did, they com they, that, that was actually found in the experiment. So that was very gratifying that uh, I will now explain this four nanomolars and one nanomolar, this is pretty high concentration for both Sonic Hedgehog and BMP. And the markers that marked for the very dorsal domain, this is PAC7 for the very ventral and KX2.2. We, we might not see it very well. I don't know what's the, what is the contrast, but still here there's a lot of ventral. There's also a lot of dorsal uh, phase, but very few if any, of the intermediate for that condition, which if we now would do the distribution, that would turn out to be qualitatively the same. Like, okay, so far, so good. But getting back to the question that I got, we also asked this question, okay, but this, this is like a descriptive language, some arguments about optimization, but the cells, how do cells do that? So in the, in the single cell level, what is acting is the gene regulatory network. They interpret the signals to give the output. So I propose a simple model of three node transcriptional network with three transcriptional factors here, V, I, D. One could give them also biological names. And 
the, mm, the genes could inhibit each other. They could also have activation from the input signals. And the gray arrows are, uh, this is like uniform activation from the background that, that makes those genes to express uh, in, uh, proteins in, in the spinal cord. One could, of course, this, another, yeah. One could define it, or it's defined through the set of ordinary differential equations with uh, just this is so-called thermodynamical model, where the constants you can roughly say, or here for each arrow there is one constant that gives one intuition about how what what is the chance of the uh, of this protein to bind to to DNA and affect the the transcription of the other proteins. And that's, so, so if you do the counting, there are 13 parameters in this model that, that I would like to know their values. There are other that we can fix using some biophysical arguments, uh, just, just to be like on the correct time scale or, or length scale. And I would like to see now having this general free node network model specified by 13 parameters for each network, what networks are selected if I impose on if I impose all the experimental conditions or some of the experimental conditions. So what I do, I start just with a very large set of networks. And then I do computational screens when I first ask, okay, which, what fraction of these networks gives a stripe pattern and already this condition reduces the number of networks. Then there is so-called temporal pattern. So we, we have temporal measurements. So we know that some domains are growing, some are, some are reduced reduce in size. And finally, there is the, this uh, decoding map condition so we would like to have uh, a network that could reproduce this uh, experimental results for that, that give rise to bimodal distribution and the, uh, for both high morphogens. And it turns out that from this six, uh, from, from this set of 10 to the eighth networks, we end up with a thousand networks. And now if you try to understand the is there any are there any specific things about those networks? So we, we just, we do many things, but let's say we, we can run a, a principal component analysis and those networks seem to form a, a single cluster where each dot can be also uh, through interpolation in the parameter space reached. So, so I could connect this cluster saying that this is really like, it seems that there's just one set of solutions. I could check how those networks process noise. So in, in this case, this is very, I would say, simple because I just ask for each network if I mm, vary the input, let's say the amplitude by 50% and the decay length by 50% or so, what would be the expected imprecision in the output. And it turns out that those are pretty, in the, for, for some of the networks, at
lower concentration for longer time. In this case, the growth of the tissue is also specified. So, so there, there are these interdependencies, uh, interdependencies between the, how, how the tissue grows and how the pattern is specified. Okay, here we also observed that on another thing, the next point is that the, the positional information that is decoded from the signals seem, seems to correspond to what was in the signal which is another indication of this optimal decoding strategy. And also with the plot of the position error, we saw that initially the, the, this imprecision is specified uniquely, or specified with the, uh, a very precise uh, level throughout the, throughout the tissue. And now, what are the, the questions that those uh, that we can ask to understand it better? First, I didn't talk about the sources of morph of morphogens, but in case of Drosophila, okay, the the morphogen this bicoid, the messenger RNA of the bicoid was deposited by the mother. But in case of the spinal cord, the story is different. The source of the hedgehog and the BMP is formed along or simultaneously, almost simultaneously, to the formation of the other parts. So it's like saying that the very, let's say for the sine catchwork, the very ventral part, so-called floor plate, the size of this floor plate is also regulated by like the feedback between the, the morphogen production and the, uh, let's say the, the neighboring domain. And that, so, so the questions could be like, uh, do we have a system where you, one can have a large fluctuation in the size of the source that leads to a large fluctuation in the production rate of the morphogens, but still these fluctuations are maybe not important like downstream because there are regulatory mechanisms that are very good at correcting that. But it might be also that already at this level the size needs to be regulated with high accuracy to, to have a very precise signal downstream. Another question is how the uh, how, how the morphogens are spreading through the tissue. So I gave this example of decoid. I showed that it can be well fitted with the exponential decay. It can be, in principle, such such a proper can one can get just by. Uh, solving reaction, uh, diffusion reaction equation, like where there is diffusion, there is degradation, and the source on one side. And one gets the exponential decay. But if, in this case, if we now do the measurement for the uh, diffusion constant, it turns out that that's just not enough, or there, there need to be other mechanisms like uh, that, that, that allow this the morphogen molecules to reach, let's say, this 100 micrometers. Also, in the spinal cord, this just diffusion would be difficult to explain the spreading of morphogens because there in the spinal cord, the tissue is it's, it's densely packed tissue. So people are considering either diffusion a lot in the extracellular space in the regions between the cells or through the cells with so-called endocytosis, the morphogen molecules in principle could enter the cell and get out with some probabilities. There's also the question about how the, because the morphogens that are, let's say, floating in this extracellular space, to activate genes, they need to bound to the receptors at the cell, uh, cell boundaries. And this can be also of, of a different type, like can be like one could imagine that they are quickly bound and unbound, or they can stay there for a longer time. Also affecting what what kind of uh, profile they make. In the end. Here, there is also one difficulty about the exper of experimental nature that it's 
for, for the soil cash in BMP, we don't have a good way to measure the, the morphogenesis molecules directly. We can measure their output signals. So the profiles that I was showing you, I was also I always brought like BMP signal. That's because you could measure like what gets into the cell. So the, there is a need for a modeling that would kind of link all those things together. <coughs> And with a goal to make like new predictions, like can you? Because how what, what got me interested in this uh, systems biology or quantitative biology is that you could do a model and then you could do a prediction that that either classifies your model or or confirms that or there is I don't know, something new that, that we could discover. And there are also another more questions like related, let's say, to the timing of the decoding in the Drosophila. There was just there, this decoding takes minutes, so it's pretty fast. In the spinal cord, it's, uh, when, when I said like 13 domains of gene expression, they are also specified in, in a, some, let's say, specific fashion, like from the middle domains to the, towards the edges, which means that in the regions where there is actually the steepest gradient of the morphogens, the, the domains are specified that, uh, as, as, uh, like, as the last things. And finally, I'm also going to ask more general questions about how one can link the self-organizing modes of pattern specification. And here I mean uh, basically Turing kind of uh, Patterns like diffusion driven instability that would cause a kind of wave pattern that is stable. That you, you could, uh, nice, I, I know, like uh, a very popular uh, example of that is like you, you have the very, like some fish have, have very, like the, their pattern is, is very, like there are stripes or there are. Uh, those, yeah, like in the fish or uh, in, in human, the one of the examples is that the formation of the five digits. So this is also a distinct part or with defined through the self-organizing uh, modes pattern specification. Okay, and having that, I would like to thank uh, my collaborators and uh, from from ISD and also abroad from Francis Crick Institute for doing yeah, for, for uh, measuring cool stuff and also the the funding agencies that that uh, that support the, those projects, which is the National Science Center and the Sonata and and the Polish uh, returns from NAID. National Agency of Academic Exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, please. So, I have a few questions. Yes. <clears throat> so, so, you said that the high concentration for short time can be replaced by lower concentration for long time, or it's not really true? Yes, I said that, and it's I could, I could give a paper where they show that for a group of genes in the in the ventral side but yes like you, you could draw a kind of uh, time this or concentration map where where different domains can be reached based on yeah, how you how you approach exactly with those parameters like the exposure time and the concentration and did you measure any case when like a wrong distribution caused an embryo to not being able to, to evolve. Let's say some flap or some other random distribution. So, uh, I actually have a one thing. Let me show you my. Uh, okay. So here you see a stripe pattern, and here there is a pattern if one of the morphogens is abolished. Like we, like we killed the sine heterog, 
And what you get in the ventral side is like a very mixed pattern of like here you could, you could make the domains for just a single embryo, not, not even without averaging, but here th this is like a complete mess. So yeah, you could do mutants and you could measure those things. Saying what happens if you modify that and whether this fits in the model. So for example, if you would add a high concentration to the uh, the other part, then you could grow like two heads for um, uh, for, for um, so for the head, so so the embryo would be very likely not survivable, yeah. and uh, if that that even for drosophila, like, I could do an experiment that, that it would be good for both sides. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it it will get good the, the genes that you expect, but then it won't survive. But what? Uh, yeah. So some <laughs> things experimentally are like. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there were experiments in the 60s, 70s, <laughs> grafting, where you put the beads that have like specific morphogens, and yeah, you could have, I don't know, floor plates, or so the sources of the twinkage, or. But um, there's something more to this. <clears throat> Actually, you can at some point. There are some stage of development. You can take a part of embryo from one part mm -hmm. and put it in the other part, and it will actually grow into yeah. a functional. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't know. Stuff. I, I, I think this problem. experiment is well done. And yeah. so this is interesting in this context that, that, that there has to be a moment at which this, uh, this gradient of, it doesn't matter anymore. It's like, uh, yes. There's a moment <laughs> when, when these cells are already encoded enough so they will do their own thing. Yeah, exactly. No, we, we were. Thinking about exactly that question for for a while, and we figure out okay, it's from the data, it's like 30 hours. You could do exactly what you, like the cells are. But okay, anyway, uh, you you could measure how yeah the, the correlation between so so this. It's very high for the early stage, and then it drops out. Like exactly, there is there is a some time window where they get independent. But you could also say, mm, yeah, that's probably what we expect from the system, which it's not trivial. That it kind of evolved in a way that it uses this time window, this initial time window to get to specify like the initial condition, and then it uh, evolves for them. It's, Dynamics. Yeah, but I would I would still argue you now it's th those are in principle the mechanisms are the same, but like maybe different part of the mechanism. Because the general regulatory well, network. Totally remember from embryology. Mm -hmm. Basically, like this initial gradient, they they, they set the proper the red vessels or those activations yeah, the the initial and then in the further development, like a whole. What will happen inside the, yeah. the cell? And, well, well, you know, just rewire for, for yeah, the well, problems, the, the, the uh, set of genes, yeah, but the network of genes, yeah. yeah. No, that's uh, yeah. For, for some organs, I don't know, for the frog, you could indeed cut the embryo in half at some stage and do yeah. the problems. Well, yeah. Another question. Just, uh, okay. What's the relation of this, of this reaction division? In a slightly different context, but uh, think about the uh, okay, division of bacteria in the heart. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a great work on when guys just, you know, they do the reactions, they do what kind of proteins, they just put it into the, you know, set of reaction diffusion system, but they got perfectly, you know, this instability, mm -hmm. they got a, a precisely uh, why bacteria has to be half in this, this region. So, so here you've shown us the, this, this, these patterns of stripes in this embryo. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is exactly like a Turing pattern, which are related to the reaction diffusion equation. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, it's like, we can use for some of uh, these effective models in reaction diffusion equations, so, or this is like a, your, your approach is like a complementary? Or so in, in biology, it's, uh, I would say it's also a pretty hot topic that most systems are, are either driven by the Turing reaction diffusion or by from Lewis Walker, this graded positional information. But there are cases, uh, like there's one paper from Cell in 2000, 
thing, I guess, uh, where they say that, like, for the format digits in, in, a, uh, in the kingdom, actually, the both signals could uh, act together, saying, like, there is, or, or in general, you could imagine that there is a graded profile that then kind of starts just doing instability, uh, diffusion driven instability that, that creates a baby pattern. Or you have a wave pattern, and then on the, on the landscapes of those waves, you actually have a graded profiles that are used by this uh, positional information. So, so, so I think you know, cells are kind of polar right there. When they get a signal from one side, it's not necessarily that they can give the same signal on the other side. Yeah? I mean, so they can uh, maintain the internal, uh, internal gradient of whatever they want. Uh, so, because it wasn't presented this gradient like, you know, cells were passive to this. Oh. And from what I remember, it was like, oh. I would say, so, so like active, yeah, they, they, they take the signal, but it also produces the same signal in some other way. So and it's it's provided it very depends on the system. There are systems like in zebrafish where the cells could actually rearrange, like mechanistically, due to the signal. But in the spinal cord, there is also like the, after let's say this 30 hours, there is not so much movement. But the, at the initial stage, there is a movement, and we are studying this with so-called vertex models, that you really model the tissue and look for the rearrangement, whether they are affecting the precision reader or whether the morphogens are affecting somehow the rearrangements. So this, it's good to have in mind this layer of uh, at, at, at the cellular layer. But there is also like something like energy function related to the, the, the cell volume and how it gets minimized to and that that might cause different rearrangements of the cells. So so just in simple language that would mean that or one example could be if we have um, let's say cells that ended up in the wrong domain, like let's say red ended up in the blue domain, then one way would be okay the cells are actually that, that cell could Get back to the correct domain through really like moving in space, like moving through cellular rearrangements, or it can be also eliminated through uh, either through differentiation or just uh, just uh, get uh, and then that's that's also an open question whether there are the self-correcting mechanisms active in the tissue. So. There are many open questions, and it's also yeah. But uh, you talk about the you know, physical way, way yeah, that but the cells move. But I, I want to point to something else. But the cell itself mm -hmm. you know, can be you know, can receive the chemical signal, but it can also produce the same chemical signal with some mm -hmm. different concentrations of. So, so, so for for the know that there are examples of cell assembly of you know some cells that produce signals and they eventually make some you know, macroscopic pattern of, of chemical concentration. Yes. When, all of them are producing this thing. I agree. Yeah, I so agree. In, in, in the spinal cord, it's it's important. not the case, or not not. I mean, we know. We, it's not the case. Or you okay. know, people haven't seen this effect in the spinal cord yet. Or and and it it's there. It's like less than ten percent of the years in the spinal cord. But some some other questions. I have a short one, maybe. Okay. Because you you are basically. Talking about theoretical aspect, can you say something about the instrumentation? How actually the things are measured, being measured? Yes. Okay, so for uh, like Drosophila and Gross, this uh, one, one good thing about those is they're mostly like transparent, so you could really do live imaging with microscopy. With the mouse embryos, that's a different story. You could try to have the embryo and keep it alive, do some life imaging, but this is extremely difficult and so far it's I think 24 hours, that's, that's the most. Uh, but those are done by just taking the embryos, then killing them, cutting the spinal cord. From each embryo one could get like 
five seven spinal cord cross sections. Mm -hmm. So those are from different embryos, mm -hmm. taken at different embryonic days. They are immunostained, so marked for the expression mm -hmm. of some proteins that are then measured when, when, uh, with, with the fluorescent microscopy. But uh, and now to, to get this time course, we just uh, order them here. Uh, okay, one. Here we order them based on the length of uh, this on the on the torso ventral length because what is uh, quite precise in those is that the cells are there are many cells that are multiplying. One could fit exponential growth in the whole thing, and one one could really order. Using length, this dorsometer length, as a proxy for time, we to order them and then consider it as a, just one large time. Group. So here, for, for the data, for the paper I was presenting, we, we had like 300 uh, yeah, images to, to get the reasonable uh, time space resolution. That was a question, but I think we'll do it again.